Let's keep going, please. Okay, we're going we're gonna to kick off. Um, I really get that this is a long day, and, and after this session, we've got um, the final of the breakout sessions, um, and, and so, there's, so there's, lots, there's lots and lots to do. Um, it's the middle of the afternoon. Um, we had a fantastic lunch. Um, some of us had glasses of red or white wine or both, and we're probably on a bit of a slump. So to just to sort of try and get a bit more energy going, I'd like you to do something that in my country, we don't like doing. <laughs> Will you please go and just for one minute, 60 seconds, go and talk to somebody who you have not yet said hello to during this event, okay? Now. Now. And then in one minute, back in your chairs. Okay, begin. Can you begin to go back to your seats? I think the only people who are still standing are members of the board. Uh, hey, wasn't that good? I think we're going to start every session like that. Okay. Um. Okay, this, um, this is the second part of the sort of trying to challenge our structural thinking um, bit. So again, please, you don't have to get up this time. Uh, again, your pen in your writing hand, blank sheet of paper, uh, challenges as to what you want your uh, European Federation to be doing as a result of the conversations that you hear. It might just be it's Somebody says something and it sparks a completely different thought. Doesn't matter. Just write it down. And when we go out to the last session, just leave it on the stage. Uh, the contribution so far from the people from this morning, thank you so much. That's really, really helpful and invaluable. That's great. The title of this session is Responding to Tough Times. Is the world around us changing faster than we are? So it's challenging us as to whether we are being agile, responsive, flexible enough. Um, and I thought just to sort of kick it off, uh, I would say some general comments. And then again, I'm rather hoping that somebody's going to pick up the microphone and, and run with it. When I flew here yesterday, I flew on Iberia Express. So Iberia is an airline, a national carrier, and the flagship airline of a, a, a very large and proud country has at some stage made the decision and decided 
that it needs to compete with the discounters by producing a arrival coffee, Iberia Express. That's quite interesting because we probably are all sitting here bleating about the competition, but we're not taking the competition on. But at the same time, Iberia is part of an international group which includes British Airways. So I thought I'd booked a British Airways flight. It was only when I turned up at the airport that I discovered I was on an Iberia flight because they are part of the same business. They're part of the same company. Why? Because they've looked at how they ruthlessly remove cost from their businesses by being part of something bigger and scale, and scale of economy. Um, and through that work, they're able to respond to the Aldi or the Lidl of the skies, Ryanair. The parallels with our world are quite, or with the food industry, are quite, are quite interesting and quite similar. Um, in my country, um, we like chocolate a lot, and uh, we have two main chocolate companies, and they are at each other's throats. Um, they hate each other. Uh, they, um, they but when a shop gets a delivery of a product from Nestle, they will also get a delivery from a product from Mars at the same time. Because even though they are bitter, bitter rivals and they are competing directly for market share with each other, they have worked out that rather than duplicating a Mars lorry to go to a corner shop and then a Nestle lorry to go to a corner shop, that if they combined their logistics into a joint business, then everybody saves money. Now, I'm not suggesting that that's a parallel for what we should be doing. But what I am suggesting is that lateral thinking, can you imagine the executive in Mars who first said, I think we should merge our logistics with Nestle. <laughs> can you imagine how long they lasted in their job and how many years it probably took before that became a reality? I've got a couple of notes. I've got some points here. I, I haven't got great digest, but I've got a, a, a very simple little um, uh, flow chart that I want to just sort of make a couple of themes, comments on. We need more food. That's essentially, if you really boil it down, is the issue uh, in, the, in the vast majority of cases. But how do we get the food industry to prioritize us and be working with us and giving us more food uh, and, and less, you know, what, are the th what are the things that we should be doing? We've got to matter more to that food industry. So we need to get into the head of and understand how do we solve their problems for them? And the growth of, in the UK of fair share was principally down to running a very, very major campaign of making the public really be aware of how much food was wasted in the food industry. So this is the industry that I wanted to, to have a deep, meaningful relationship with. But at arm's length, I was getting all sorts of negative PR for them. And we got to a stage where it became business critical for those businesses to be seen to be doing something, not necessarily doing it, but to be seen to be doing something around food waste. And we then became part of their solution to that problem, even, even though we helped create the problem in the, uh, uh, from their perspective in the first place. And so look at things from, uh, uh, one of the things I think we need to do is every single corporate uh, food business that we are looking at trying to work with is stop looking at through our eyes, but look through their eyes. What are they trying to achieve? What are the business challenges that they have? For example, every single food business, whether it's a manufacturer, whether it's growing food and, uh, and, and needing their crops to be picked, 
um, whether it's a logistics business, there is not enough people. Employment and filling all of the, uh, the, the, uh, the slots and places that they have to, is a business criticality to them. Now, we can't help them do that, but what we can do is make the people who work in those businesses absolutely love the business that they work for because of the difference that they make. And so that links in instantly into then transferring and looking at things like um, how are we supporting a food partner to communicate to their staff why they should be proud of their business so that they can remain uh, working in that business. And the places that are the, the hardest to employ are many of the, the biggest opportunities that are out there. I remember going to a chicken processing plant in um, the back and beyond of, of England, and they explained to me that the bi biggest business critical issue they had was re retaining staff because it was working in, uh, I mean, literally chickens were coming, dead chickens were coming in one side and packages to go out to the supermarkets was going out the other side. And it was, uh, the whole building was a freezer. Um, people were just spending their entire day working on uh, manually handling um, chickens. And, um, and when I spoke to most of the staff, this was the alternative to being not being able to feed their families, no more than that. When we then put a partnership together with them where they were going to process all of the offcuts and divert food into, into, uh, into us and they were going to package it up with our branding and name on it uh, and we did a present and we, we asked specifically to go into that factory uh, one lunchtime and do a series of presentations in the canteen. The union leader of uh, the business came up and said, I have worked here for 15 years. This is directly to the chief executive. I have worked here for 15 years, and this is the first day that I am proud to work for this business because of what we are doing there. He said, that is worth a huge amount of money on the bottom line for me, much more than the cost of the chicken that we're giving you, much more than the uh, additional time on the intervention. We have to look through the lenses of the food industry much more. Um, COP28 20, uh, COP that Tom was referring to uh, this morning is a big deal for the food industry. Um, the environmental reporting is a big deal for the food industry. Are we focused with a real laser-like focus on making sure that we're solving the problems that are coming down the track for them? By and a link to that is, are we investing enough in data? Do we have the right measurements in place? Are those measurements credible to be able to give to our partners? Um, and if not, why not? <laughs> because we need to give them stuff that they absolutely believe and can then take and run with. And data then leads into, uh, again, another area that Tom, um, Tom made reference to around policy and advocacy and lobbying uh, re and referencing government. And we're gonna come back to this um, again tomorrow um, in, um, in Lisa's words. Um, are we providing the right information for, um, for our government, for, for our regulators, for our decision makers? Or are we just telling them how many meals and how many people and how many babies? That works for the public, that works for the, you know, the heart and minds, but that doesn't work for the policy makers and the decision makers. Um, where's the impact data? Where's the cost benefit analysis? You know, all of these phrases that are, that are being used constantly in, in, uh, in the business world. The, uh, one of the guests last night was um, the uh, global director of HR for Telefonica. And I was uh, talking to him and he was saying how incredibly proud he is of the volunteering program that they, that they have. And I was saying, well, 
are you sending teams in to food banks to make up parcels? Or are you sending teams into food banks to help them address some of these types of issues? Because this is what you guys in the commercial world are really good at. And uh, Now, all of this requires money. I think we've got to get serious as a network about fundraising. I'm going to be controversial. I don't think most of the food industry has heard of us, and I don't think most of um, the general public have, have heard of us. Um, not, in a, not in a sense of other than, yes, I recognize those two words, food and bank, put together. Um, and unless we are incredibly stronger at building a brand and everybody understanding what that brand really stands for and the communication and the marketing of that brand, uh, then we're never going to succeed. And you need that brand and you need that marketing um, uh, positioning in place before the fundraising can then take place. We're all used to the, f you know, the donor fatigue. We've had um, a um, uh, couple of years over the pandemic when many of us raised very, very large sums of money. Um, we've got to refresh that message because the message is, is, is just as big. The emergency is even bigger. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't think we should just go, oh, you know, there are so many more businesses, there are so many more uh, um, companies that we can, we, can, uh, we can address, we can approach, we can partner with, and we can work on. And I get that all costs money. But if we're going to, if we're going to really respond, those are some of the things that, that we need to be doing. We're going to address competition in, um, uh, in in one of the, uh, um, well, we've been addressing it all, all the way along, but it's, uh, but it's coming up again in um, one of the sessions that's coming up, commercial competition and alternative uses of, of food. Um, but, you know, the example that came out of the, 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 the microphone session this morning from Balak of how they in Hungary have taken a, have taken a, uh, a real challenge, the presence of Too Good To Go, and flipped it on its head and worked in partnership with Too Good To Go, Mars, um, Mars and Nestle again, um, uh, to, to be able to deliver some added value for them um, and, on, and, on, and on the Too Good To Go side, I think is a really, really interesting example. I, I'm running one of the other sessions, so I can't contribute in the, in the competition session. But in the United Kingdom, there is a, um, a for-profit business called Company Shop. Company Shop has a proposition to the food industry that says, we will take your surplus. If we can sell it to people who work in the health system or in the food industry, so, and they have a, they have a, a membership card, so it's, not a, it's, it's a slightly sort of closed market. Uh, if we can sell it, uh, we will give you 10% of the retail value. If we can't sell it, you don't have any disposal cost. So from company shop's perspective, it's a win-win. My opposite number at company shop uh, owns a yacht in Monaco. He sold the business for 80 million pounds uh, and has now retired. There is no company shop in any of your countries. If we went back 30 years and Fair Share had invented company shop, selling the food to uh, health workers and uh, families of policemen and, the, and people who work in the food industry, and then using that funding to drive Fair Share as a, as a, as a, as a major food bank organization, we would be a transformationally different place and space than, than we are now. I don't know why Company Shop has not expanded internationally. I ask you all to go and research Company Shop. 
it's, I think, an amazing business, a very clever business, a very simple business, uh, and it's a business that is aligned with minimizing food waste. Um, final comment, and, and my final comment is going to be, uh, I'm going to be deliberately um, provocative. I think if we're going to need, if we're going to show the innovation and the creativity and the, the agility that we are going to need to do to not just survive but to thrive, we need more agi agile leadership. And I'm not convinced that the um, generic historical federated model of decision making is necessarily as agile as the market that we now work in needs to be. And, and I think national federations need to look at how do we continue to respond to our members, engage with our members, uh, be reactive, uh, but also show proactive, positive directive leadership. Now, my best example, and I'm sorry, I'm going to embarrass um, the Netherlands. My best example that, that I, I love uh, of, um, across Europe um, is the Dutch model, where, um, first of all, you know, even though I've, I've, I've made a living out of food banking for, for, for the last 14 years or so, there are no employees. And there is a very, very responsive mechanism to um, listening to the members, responding to the members. But I kind of guess that the leadership that's in place in, um, in the National Federation is asking the right leadership questions to get then the answer from the membership. So there is, a, so there is proactive leadership happening there. It isn't what do you want us to do? With the, and, and then waiting for, for, for the diverse uh, and eclectic uh, range of membership to, to respond. Um, but I think some of these challenges around owning the brand, raising money, proactively uh, leading on owning the relationships with national food suppliers, um, the policy and advocacy uh, work all needs to be led through one voice, one powerful, one strong uh, voice, um, talking authoritatively to all of the right stakeholders at a national federation level. And right, why have I said that? Um, because this session is around: uh, Do we? Are we at a crossroads? Do we need to change uh, some of what of what we're doing? I don't want to get into a debate or, 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 or a defensiveness of saying that won't work for us or that. That's the beauty about the eclectic nature of who we all are. We, you, you are, we are all different. Um, the conversation that we now need to have is around how are we driving challenge and change? And I'm going to stop with that question and I'm going to kind of hope that somebody will kick us off in, um, in the 10 minutes that we've got to just talk about what they're doing in their countries about trying to drive this being fit for tomorrow uh, on the back of the amazing legacy of the past. And being an Englishman, I'm going to have my cup of tea <laughs> because it's 10 past four and it's tea time. Anybody prepared to... Um, contribute either on that and tell and it, and, and it can be you're talking out your backside Lindsay or, um, uh, uh, or on anything else in this broad general um, how we respond to the future challenges Alison I know I'm talking out my backside you don't need to tell me that um, I just wanted to flip it round so you're looking at it from the the centralized approach of um, I'm taking the point around how we sort of market ourselves centrally as a body and make people want to work with us. I just wanted to share an example of something that Kellogg's did with us this summer, and I think they did it with a lot of you as well, is they did 
a campaign on TV. They did an advert. They wanted to come and film in one of our charities because they were running a European campaign to say, this is what we do to help children over the summer holidays. So if they recognize the benefit of collectively bringing together what they do in lots of different countries, why can't we flip that over and go to people like Kellogg's, maybe they're doing it, but other folks like that, and identify where we've all got points in common and come up with campaigns that they can be proud of. Because what Kellogg's is doing is telling their consumers, look what we're doing all around the UK. They want that publicity, they want that credibility, they want to tell consumers stuff that they don't see and they don't know. Why don't we help other companies do that so it's easier for them by connecting with all the programs that we're doing and just doing a bit of a share and going who are you working with what campaigns and we approach them collectively with some content and and a reason to communicate so is it a time of year is it a particular type of beneficiary group that we've got in common i think there's something that we don't share from a communications point of view so i don't really know my opposite numbers um, in the other countries for communications. But I bet we're all doing lots of very similar things that I don't know because I'm not telling you and you're not telling me. And I think we could turn that into a positive. And if that, if that prompts a challenge for FIBA, write it down and stick it here. Hello? Hello. Okay. Um, I suppose building on Alison's point, uh, I would agree with the, like, if you think about some of our um, uh, for profits entering the market, like Too Good To Go, you know, they have a full mar kind of global marketing campaign, you know, with the likes of potentially Unilever and others. But we in this room have that and more and we're just all so busy all the time that it is hard to you know come together on all the different pieces where we'll be sharing policy and legislation marketing and communications or actually like mapping out who's working with who across all and that would help FIBA even in terms of approaching the big guys that you've more information uh, about what's actually happening on the ground so that we could share more marketing and communications is one thing but even back office functions in terms of systems reporting data and we do it in a in a really interesting way so you know we do share knowledge sharing but could we take it a step further and come up with some kind of agreement where it gets a little bit deeper than that so rather than just sharing best practice we kind of sign up and say right you know, open source all our data, open source um, how we're doing the data management, how we're doing policy, how we're doing legislation, and be a little bit more committed. But it does actually take resources because it's brilliant going to the different workshops that FIBA organize, but then we just go back to doing our own things because we're so busy. But if we could maybe put more structure around what we're committing as a group, then we may reap the benefits, but it does take, I suppose that's why the EU is so good, but so complicated, is that you have to allow the member states to do what they need to do, but then bring it together. And I think there's so much value in what everybody's doing, but it's, it's lovely to hear everyone has the same challenges, but it's also a little bit frustrating yeah. that we're not actually knocking them on the head and moving on to the next one when, so I, when we come to things like Okay, so to build on that, a couple of comments. First of all, um, advert for the session tomorrow morning. Balash is going to talk to us about measuring carbon. There is huge opportunities for us delivering part of what the food industry is m going to be and is being mandated to record and report. I won't say any more than that, but, but that is going to require proper, proper collaborative working. For some of us, it might mean that we stop the methodology that we're doing now at, for the greater good of a wider vision. Um, you know, FIBA could centrally, if you wanted us to, is to convene a serious conversation at pace with you all about, and with the food industry, go and do some research. And say, what's the what are the measures, what's the data that's really going to make you sit up and want to work with us more and come back with that? 
The challenge is, is that we then go, right, you, we've all got to measure slightly different things in a slightly different way. And if that means that the database or the data system that we put into place two years ago that cost a million euros needs changing or tweaking, or it's just a simple case of, for 35 years, we've done it this way and we're not changing. Unless we're prepared to challenge some of that m way of thinking, um, then, then we're not gonna, then we're not gonna drive forward. And by the way, if this stuff was easy, we'd have done it. It isn't, no way. Uh, well, I think that what separates us from others is that we contribute both with the environmental solution and with a social impact solution. So we need to measure all of that. Not only the carbon footprint, but also the social impact of what free food is, uh, is uh, resulting in. Uh, how we mobilize the whole voluntary sector to give all kinds of different aids. If you could put some more data on that, that would really be an advantage together with the, the carbon footprint. So uh, that, that is something I would really like to have out to do. <laughs> and so we need a really engaging conversation um, tomorrow. The session tomorrow is, is, is a short update from Balash because there is a, a very active, and I hope after, to, after this um, conference, a more active, a more engaged um, working group looking at trying to harmonize and, and, and work together on this. Because you're right, we've got to get this right. We've got to get it right. And if we don't get it right, no, no, no food business will touch it. Because they'll go, I, you know, those numbers don't mean anything to me. I don't measure it like that. We measure it like that. Because we're adopting X standard or Y standard. Right, that's meant to be a segue into um, into the into the next sessions, um, and um, the these these next sessions are um, they're not repeats of what we've uh, what we've just done in the breakout rooms um, where, uh, twice. Um, so we're only breaking um, now down into uh, into four different groups, uh, and we're, we're looking at um, commercial competition alternative uses threats and opportunities. Um, if the demand is greater than the supply, are we giving the food to the people who most need it? Um, and challenging the social impact um, side. Uh, policy and legislative opportunities. Can we learn from other countries? And um, what are the opportunities and challenges of buying food and how do we fund it? And, um, and as we've discovered in the session this morning, um, I think Probably a lot of us walked into here thinking it's black and white, surplus food, buying food, and we've suddenly discovered it's all actually quite gray in the middle because some strategic purchasing helps facilitate, um, um, so yeah, some strategic purchasing helps facilitate more surplus. So those are the, those are the four groups. Um, in the process that you've now got used to, so um, I'm first of all going to do the brown group. The fair share staff member who is supporting this is Sophia. Um, so do you want to come? Did I say fair share? Listen, th 13 years, FIBA, apologies. I'm amazed I haven't done more of that. We are FIBA. <laughs> <laughs> 